I focused became find the healthy business inside of the unhealthy failing business. I, it sounds so simple, but it's critical. I took the financials for the past few years and I put the revenue into buckets. And so mm. I had a bucket on franchise fees. I had a bucket on online sales. I had a bucket on sales to retail stores that were not branded stucky. So we were selling some limited product to these other stores. And I realized that we, how we were generating our money was through the sale of product. <laughs> Starting or growing your business is hard work. But now you are listening to the Better Business Podcast with me, Steve Cook, and I'm going to try and make it a little easier on you. We on this podcast help you grow a better business with real advice from professionals, and today is no different. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Better Business Podcast. I am your host, Steve Cook, as always. Today, my guest is a fine lady by the name of Stephanie Stuckey. In 2019, she inserted herself as the CEO of Stuckey's, which is a third-generation business that was started in 1937 by her grandfather as a roadside pecan stand. While under her direction, Stuckey's has been growing rapidly and acquiring a few of its key suppliers, such as Front Porch Pecans and Atwell Pecans. Today, Stuckey's has 65 locations, a distribution center, an active e-commerce business, and over 200 retailers that sell their snacks. Stephanie, thank you so much for being on. And I have the first question that I've been dying to ask you is, is it pecans or pecans? Right? I get asked that a lot, as you can imagine. So I'm going to give the answer that my grandfather gave, which is they're pecans when you pick them and pecans when you sell them. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But the logic so, there is always focus on the needs of your customer. And 70% of Americans say pecans. That was according huh. to a survey that was actually conducted, the pecan shellers of america conducted the survey i'm from middle georgia like my grandfather and i find myself slipping into what is natural for me which is pecan which does betray my southern roots but honestly i i switch back and forth and i try to make whoever i'm talking to feel comfortable so i'll adjust <laughs> That's funny. Um, you know, I wanted to talk to you about the business. So, um, at some point, you know, your business started with your your family. Talk to me about kind of the the just a quick synopsis of the the um, business as it took place from 1937 all the way to kind of before you took control of it. Um, what did the business go through? Some of the changes that it, it had, um, obviously the store, the business dipped its toe into retail and things like that. So um, kind of talk about where the business went through. Um, if you could kind of sum it up for us. I will do my best to sum up 85 plus <laughs> years of history And we did more than dip our toe into retail. We dove into it full steam ahead. Uh, So let me take a quick trip in the Wayback Machine to 1937. We were started as a roadside pecan stand. From those humble origins, my grandfather grew Stuckey's into what was the first roadside retail chain in this country. We, at our peak, had 368 stores in 40 states. And we offered something very unique. We had, at the time, it was unique. Now there's Pilot, TA, Bucky's, you name it, Cracker Barrel. Cracker Barrel doesn't sell gas, but there's all sorts of competitors on the interstate highway system. But when we started, we were the only chain, and we sold gas. We had clean restrooms. We had candies and pecan snacks that we made ourselves we had quick hot meals at a snack bar and we were known for an experience we sold kitschy souvenirs like rubber alligators and coonskin caps and i actually have some of our stuff here uh so those of you who are visually watching we used to sell these ceramic monkeys wearing shriners hats at smoke (laughs) 
cigars. <laughs> they puff cigars. They've since banned those. Uh, we had these little ducks, magnetic ducks you bathe with. So just Wee Wee Willie and Duncan Birds and like all these fun, kitschy souvenirs back in the day. So what happened to us? My grandfather sold a company in 1964 to Pet Dairy Corporation. Pet had a series of corporate takeovers. The roadside travel industry started to plummet when there was the Arab oil embargo and air travel became more affordable. And so the company, when it really tanked, was it was owned by a Chicago railroad conglomerate and they were shutting down all the stores. My father got the wow. company back. It was really a fire sale. He was running other successful businesses at the time. He kept Stuckey's afloat for about 30 years by pairing Stuckey's with one of his other businesses, which is Interstate Dairy Queen Corporation. So he started co-branding. People interested in retail know this is now super popular. You'll pull over at a roadside place and you'll see under a travel plaza roof, a Subway, a Dunkin', a variety of different options, right? And there's these almost like a little kiosk or sections. So my grandfather, my father was doing that in the 80s. So that's how he got Stuckey's to come back, so to speak, and, and uh, move forward with that concept. He sold Interstate Dairy Queen Corporation in 2012 to Berkshire Hathaway. He and his business partners retired. They left a skeleton crew running Stuckey's. We started losing accounts because the roadside retail industry is extremely competitive. There were a lot of the chains we were in got bought out and they didn't keep our brand. So when I came on board in November of 2019 and bought the company from my dad's former business partners and then my father, we were three, we were six figures in debt. We did not own or operate any of our stores. We had about 60, two locations we've only added a few locations because that's not how we're driving our profit but we had about 62 locations that were all uh, franchised at the time and that was it we had a rented distribution facility so a lot so was this a private i mean th this was still a private company at that point you mentioned berkshire hathaway which obviously is a public uh company stuckey's has always remained private a private company correct berkshire hathaway only bought the Interstate Dairy Queen Corporation. They did not buy stuff. Gotcha. They bought the profitable gotcha. business. Interstate Dairy Queen <laughs> was very successful. That was my father's business. Oh, old Warren Buffett knows what he's doing, huh? Exactly. And he owns American Dairy Queen for those who follow the Oracle from Omaha and know that. And so it was a perfect complement to his existing portfolio. But he was not interested in Stuckey's. I wish he would be. That would be really nice to have Warren Buffett as my partner. He does own C's Candy. <laughs> and he, he, he talks a lot about C's Candy and his post and his talks. And that's a wonderful brand. I'm a huge fan of C's. So obviously you knew about the company. You knew the ins and outs and kind of the back end of the company. I did but not. you for I didn't know anything. Oh, you didn't? You no. didn't keep up with it at all? No, what? I was not so, the heir apparent. I was not groomed to run the business. I'm number four or five kids. No. I'm a So three. what? Yeah, no. This you, is not, at not what point did you say, like, I want to get into this business? Because – uh, presumably you had a, a good paying job and was where, where you were comfortable in, in yeah. what you were doing at the time, right? I had a career. I was 52 years old. I headed up sustainability for the city of Atlanta. And then I transitioned from that role to a private nonprofit that worked throughout the country on sustainability issues. And they created a new division for me. And I was rocking and rolling, loved my career. Before that, I'd been a state representative for 14 years. So I had a whole career in government, politics, and environmental advocacy. That was that was my calling. Uh, but then I got a call, literally a call from one of my dad's former business partners one day asking me if I wanted to buy Stuckey's. It was for sale. That's what wow. happened. It was for sale, and I was I was at the time very flattered that they thought I could run the company, and then I found out that. They had asked like 10 people before me. 
<laughs> you were uh, to the bottom of the list, huh? I found out when I called my siblings and asked them if they'd go in on this with me, and they said, oh, we already turned that down. <laughs> it's kind of with, it's kind of like when you get invited to lunch with somebody and you tell your friend, yeah, I'm going to lunch with such and such. They're like, oh, they called me and asked to go too. Yeah. And you're like, oh, what? <laughs> So, uh, well, so you weren't necessarily flattered. Uh, sounds like, uh, you were, <laughs> you were the only sucker who was, uh, interested in looking into it, huh? Correct. So why, <laughs> so why, well, why did you go ahead and look into it? Obviously, um, we know the rest of the story. You bought it, but why, why did you decide to even look into it? Was it, did it seem like a challenge that you would like to take on? Did it seem like, um, you know, something that you could, you, keep on your family's legacy like why there's a lot of answers to that and it's complicated but i will say since i know your audience skews younger they, they can relate to this maybe even though i'm in my 50s i was naive when it came to business and i actually think that was a superpower one of the things i've learned is turn your vulnerabilities into strengths or at least own your vulner vulnerabilities because your competitors are gonna take advantage of it. So at least acknowledge, mm. take a hold of it, figure out what has been a challenge for you. And I really didn't know a whole lot about business. And even though I consulted experts and had financial advisors review the reports and the balance sheets and the income statements and help me decide about price and negotiation and all that i still lacked a lot of savvy when it came to owning and operating a business and so i think that actually helped me buy the company because I, otherwise i might not have done it and you're right you touched upon the family connection i'm sure there are people who run family businesses or contemplating it listening and there is an emotional tug there and mm. i'd say the last thing is something much broader which i think if you're really going to have a brand that has sticking power it's a lot more than just i'm selling a product it's or a service it's i'm building community around a shared passion and for me that passion is the road trip i grew up traveling mm. by car we took these family vacations in a Woody station wagon. Today, people are in a SUV minivan, but the experience is similar. And I see a resurgence in the road trip and that emotional connection that people have with just exploring America and pulling over and having a stop that's different and fun and more of an experience. So that's what made me do it. So what did you do? You went to a bank, you went to a business partner, you went to, you know, your dad or, or somebody like that to um, get some help or and, and get some financing for this or um, just kind of what was the ins and outs of the um, acquisition? Did it take a long time? It actually did not take a long time. And here's an advantage of being older in life as an entrepreneur. And usually people think of entrepreneurs in their 20s and 30s. But for me, it came in my 50s. But I had assets, I had savings, I had mm. a lifetime of saving up my money, and I had collateral, I had good credit, I had decades of solid jobs. And so I was more financially secure than if I'd taken this on in my 20s or my 30s, and I didn't need outside financing. So I financed That's awesome. with my own assets. Having said that, it's pretty much all my life savings, except I did not deplete my pension. So, this <laughs> so okay, so you're all in. I'm all in. So, so take me back to 2019. Um, it, that was the year that it was acquired, right? That, that you, That's right, November 1st, 2019. Okay. A little over two so, years. take me back to 2019. You put your life savings into something. Obviously, probably behind your back, some of your coworkers and stuff like that were like, she's gone off the rails. Yeah. We're not sure what's going on uh, with her, but she's gone through a midlife crisis or something. Yeah. Um, you you go all in on this business. Tell me about you kind of get into the business and start working with it. What were they doing wrong? Um, I'm curious about, you know, if, if this is a successful turnaround, you had to start identifying some things mm -hmm. that were they were not doing well. What were those things? Well, I would, I would change that a little bit and say, what were they doing right? 
and double down on what okay. they're doing right. So my focus became find the healthy business inside of the unhealthy failing business. I, it sounds so simple, but it's critical. I took the financials for the past few years and I put the revenue into buckets. And so mm. I had a bucket on franchise fees. I had a bucket on online sales. I had a bucket on sales to retail stores that were not branded stucky. So we were selling some limited product to these other stores. And I realized that we, how we were generating our money was through the sale of product. Okay. And our number one product was the pecan log roll, which is what we're best known for. And so I figured do more of that. So how do you make more money selling product? Well, there's a couple ways. One is you reduce your costs on the front end. We were outsourcing our product at the time. So we had hmm. outside entities that we were paying to make our product. And so how can we, how can we start making our product again? And that's how my grandfather did it. I also studied what he did. I went through all of his papers. I spent months just wow. pouring through his papers. And he came alive to me, went from being my grandfather to Stucky, the businessman who built this from nothing. And he got a manufacturing plant. He had a distribution facility. He had a trucking company. He had a billboard company. So he was vertically integrated and he controlled as much as possible of the business, the core business. And he mm. made his money from the sale of product too. It wasn't from the stores. He didn't own or operate the stores. He was constantly just selling his product. So I got a business partner because I knew I did not understand the manufacturing sector and I needed someone who really had a grasp on manufacturing and the pecan business. And mm. so I got a business partner. We we're 50, 50 all in on owning Stuckies. That's the healthy nut company you mentioned. From okay. Pecan. So we merged, our companies merged. And so we now own front porch pecans, which is part of Stuckies corporation. And jointly, we bought a pecan shelling plant and a manufacturing plant. And we are in the process of hopefully, knock on wood, buying a distribution facility. So we'll own our distribution instead of renting. Uh, so we're now making the product ourselves. Our margins are better. Our, our quality is better. Uh, the problem You're able to control it at less. least. Yes, yeah. and the branding's better. So we improved the branding. And we were able at that point to expand into channels, retail channels that had previously not been an option for us because of the price structure. Anyone who's trying to get into grocery channels will understand this. You have to often pay slotting fees. Sometimes you have to go through their distributor and the distributors have upfront costs that they demand. You have to bake into your price model for them quarterly promotions. So all of that adds to your cost structure. And if you are paying someone mm. else to make your product, you can't make the numbers work. You're, you're, you're actually not losing there. money. And so the only way we could get into grocery channels or more convenient store channels that are not branded stuckies, but just selling our core product line is if we controlled the manufacturing. So that's how I did it. That's how I turned the company around. And I don't say, I shouldn't say I, we, because it is a team. It's not just my business partner, but we have a, a small, but very hardworking team and we've done it together. Uh, so that's so the key. looking back at what your grandfather, you know, kind of started and got, had the business practices and the business um, strategy, I guess you could say in place, was there tried and true things that you learned about this is always going to work in business and this is always going to be in business? Or was it kind of hard to weed through some of the nuances that he did that, well, that's not really going to work anymore, but you know, I can learn a lesson from that. Was there things that you think that he did that's going to be for sure in business for, you know, the next, the next 100 years or, or however long? I think certainly the big concepts are tried and true, but you also in retail especially which is so competitive you have to differentiate you have to find your unique special sauce so i would shy away from these large 
principles that are going to apply no matter what because you really are going to have to figure out what's going to be different about my business model that's going to set me mm. apart from all the other entities that are in my space because there will always be competitors. So you've got to figure out not only what are you offering, but who, who's your customer? Yeah. Who, who and I think that that is to? who's your community that you're building. It sounds like that was part of his business plan, though. At the time, yeah. nobody was on the interstate <laughs> system yeah, and nobody was, started. you know, trying to appeal to that. So he was trying to go to, you know, a niche that nobody else was nobody yeah. else was in at the time. Um, so I guess those are, you know, tried and true business it, principles. It's just they they always change depending on the times. It quickly got crowded. Uh, I will give you one in particular that I really think is a strong takeaway. He put 20 percent of everything he made into marketing even in tough times. And I think, especially when COVID first hit, we saw a lot of budget cutting among corporations mm. and small businesses. And quite often, one of the first things to get cut is the marketing. And I think that should be one of the last things. You really wow. double down even in hard times on the marketing. You've got to put your brand out there. You've got to understand what your why is, as Simon Sinek says, why are you doing this? And really, really put that out there to the world. I think the other thing I would stress about my grandfather and trying not to be too general, but it's so true. He had the saying, every traveler is a friend. And so he decided very early on, his brand was we are a welcoming brand. We're a hospitable brand. We're not gonna mm -hmm. be political. We're not gonna be edgy. We're not gonna be sarcastic. We're going to be this warm, welcoming Southern hospitality brand and he stuck to that so sort of know what your essence is and stick to it and I'll give you a specific example that I'm very proud of which is during the Jim Crow era in the south when many many places on the interstate highway system or at that point there weren't always highways but on the roads a lot of places were segregated and Stuckey's was never segregated we were always an open brand and he did it in a way that was just quiet and doing the right thing. You know, his doors were open. Whoever wanted to come in mm. was welcome. He said the only people he ever wanted to exclude were people who didn't have money. <laughs> 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 so he wanted to so, spend money at his stores. But other than that, he hey, was welcome. <laughs> this isn't a kumbaya, people. You're, I'm here to make money, but. I'm here to make money. It doesn't, you know, it's okay if you only have a dollar, but. You, you come into my store and want to come out with pecan log roll. You don't just go in and use the restroom. That's bad karma. That's bad road trip karma. You don't just use the restroom. You buy a cup of coffee while you're there. <laughs> he he was in the for profit business, huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's and to awesome. This day, I refuse um, to like just pull over to a roadside place, even if it's not a Stuckey's. I won't just use the restroom. I'm like, I gotta buy a bottle of water. You gotta do. So you gotta patronize these businesses. You don't just use their facilities. Okay, let me ask you this. So I don't, I mean, is gas okay? If you get gas, can you use the facilities or do yes. you have to get something yeah. inside? Okay, gas is okay. All Many right. I've always wondered that because I'm like. No, that's that's a huge profit driver. My, okay, my grandfather okay. I just wanted to make sure. Most of his money, frankly, from the sale of Texaco gas because he got really? a penny per every gallon sold. And he made a gotcha. lot of money from his exclusive contract with Texaco, which unfortunately is long gone. Gotcha. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, do you think, do you think the business now seeing the business go through so many changes, do you think the business success is solely on the, or maybe not solely, but is it a large majority on the back of the leader of the business? Or do you think that changes in the industry can negate whether a business is successful or not? Uh, so I'm not quite sure what you mean, like on the back. So, the so years. it just seems like there's been so many changes in the world since it, a business that starts in 1937, it's gone through so many changes in the industry, meaning people travel differently. Yeah. Retail is a lot more competitive than it yeah. used to be. There's a lot of changes in the actual landscape of the, the world yeah. in general. Um, but there's also been a lot of changes in the leadership do you think that a business is more reliant on the leadership or is it more reliant on, you know, the changes in the industry being they're they're in the right place at the right time? 
I think leadership really does make a difference. And I think there's also got to be an ability to pivot and to adapt mm. to a changing environment. <laughs> if it's a good leader, they can change it into the, well, <laughs> the right in, but industry. But you still have to be true to that core, that what, you know, that why, what are we really about? And so I did have to make a major pivot in that we're not investing in stores. We don't own or operate any stores. That's our financial mm. reality. That doesn't mean we're not going to support our branded locations and they do pay us a licensing fee but i've had to focus on what is going to have this company make this company a financially healthy business and we are now profitable yay end of the year with over 10 million in sales which is is good from where we started which was over 2 million in sales so we're driving sales that's awesome and I would also say to be strategic and recognize that you can't do it all at once. I do have a dream of getting back in the roadside retail in a modest way that makes financial sense for us and also makes sense based on our capacity and our staffing and our internal operations. So we're taking all that into account and we do have that as part of our strategic plan, but it's slow growth in a way that makes sense. So, Stephanie, in, in preparation for my last uh, question, I do want to uh, thank you for the knowledge you put out on LinkedIn. You've uh, you've been, like I had mentioned before we started recording, I've been following you for several yeah. months, and you. you're you are very vulnerable sometimes and, and, you know, talk about some of the challenges as, as an entrepreneur and, and running the business that you are in. And so if you don't follow, uh, Stephanie on LinkedIn, I do, uh, recommend you do that. Um, but in way of a final, a final question, I want to ask you, um, and typically I ask people, you know, if, if, uh, your business has plateaued or something like that, what would you say to that person? But I think it would be, um, appropriate to ask you, if somebody is maybe just starting out and maybe they're looking at their family's business to take over, or they're looking at their family's, um, you know, company that has left the family, but they want to bring it back and they want to bring some of that, uh, old family business ties back into their life or something like that. What would you say to a person? Maybe they're younger, uh, younger than you and, and they're not sure what they want to do with their life. What would you say to somebody that wants to start out a business or get into the family business? So, I'll address getting into the family business part. And I think what's important is to really understand what make that business special. What's, what, what are sort of, what's a core concept of that business? So for Stuckies, we make road trips fun. That's part of our DNA and we've always sold pecans. So those are really central to what our being, our, our business is. So figure out like, what is that sacred cow? What is that specialness? And then once you know what you really want to stick to, be willing to let some of the other stuff go so that you can really hunker down on what's going to make your business profitable and healthy. And again, it's sequencing. So maybe I can't do the road trip right away. It is still part of my long-term plan. We talk a lot about the road trip. It can still be part of the story of our brand, but how we are generating our income is selling the pecan. So to translate that for someone who's looking at buying their family's business, what is it that's profitable about the business? If it is profitable, if it's not profitable, what part of the business is generating income? Where can you cut cost? And you have to be willing to be uh, a little unemotional, which is hard with a family business and Mm. cut things that aren't working and that includes letting go employees that aren't working we had to do some modest changes that made sense for us at the time and and then who else do we need on the team to give this brand fresh life so also figure out ways that you can turn it around and reinvent what's what's a fresh perspective so Stuckies, we've been around since 1937. I'm very respectful of that past, but I don't live in the past. I talk about Mm. the past, but I always try to relate it to something that's happening now. So there's a dynamic there. If you especially are dealing with a nostalgic brand or a legacy brand, we have to acknowledge that past, but at the same time, figure out a way to make it fresh and brand forward to people who are in their 20s and 30s and may not know your family or your family's brand. 
I hope that That's helped. Awesome. That was a little long-winded, but there's so much that you could pack into that question. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. I've uh, I've appreciated getting to uh, hear some advice from uh, someone in your shoes. It's uh, it's an incredible story so far, and and it, and it continues. It does. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. Hey, thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Better Business Podcast with me, your host, Steve Cook. You know, starting or growing a business is hard work, so I hope that today's advice made it just a little bit easier for you. We'll be sharing more about this exact topic all this week on my social platforms. You can find me on Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, or if you would like to get a a personalized blog post from me on this topic, you can join my email list and I will send you an email once a week. You can check the show notes to subscribe to that or find me on my website, whatever's easier for you. Now get out there and go grow a better business with this advice from today's Real Pros. Thank you for listening.